Hey everybody, it's Chris, and welcome to part two of my interview with Brian Kest. This one was a lot of fun, as you guys probably could tell from the first part of the interview. If you haven't listened to that one, you can go back to the previous episode and hear that. In this part, the second half, Brian gets into living in India and all the great things that he learned there and all the amazing experiences that he had. And there's plenty of other great bits of wisdom that you'll find very useful. And wow, over 18,000 classes taught. Pretty incredible. So here we go. Welcome to Practically Conscious from chrisbrownstudios.com. Our experience is our teacher, so there's nothing wrong with our experience regardless of what it is. Mm -hmm. Even though it doesn't always feel good and it doesn't look good and you wouldn't wish it on anybody, the truth is, is that it's important. It's mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you're getting everything you want and you just got to realize that it's not going to come the way you think it's going to come. It's going to come through what's happening right now. So um, can you take us to India and what that experience was like? I know still, even after people hear this and we just say, you don't need it to do anything other than paying attention to yourself, but still people, I think a lot of people feel like, oh, they need to go to India to have that experience. And that is where the, the birthplace of yoga. So do you feel that it, it, it's still something valuable to do? And, and can you give us a couple of uh, maybe pr- particular experiences that really affected you there? Um, you know, I don't think it's a necessary experience, but I think it's a valuable one. You know, I mean, I don't know if you need to go there. I mean, I would, I wouldn't think you do need to go there, because um, everything that's offered there, almost everything that's offered there, is offered here now. The one thing that's not offered here is India itself. You know, and India itself is an experience, and that's why I think it's, it's great to be able to go there and experience it because, um, you get to see yoga in its multifaceted expression. It doesn't. You can't really put it in a box when you're in India. It's it's being expressed in so many different ways. And one of the things that 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 I got out of that was having the freedom to express yoga in any way that I want to express yoga, instead of it being like such a dogmatic expression. You know, like it has to be this way or that way. Um, so just watching it being expressed in people's daily lives in so many different ways, I think is fascinating. Um, yoga is. I mean, India is also a very confrontational place you know I mean it's there nothing happens there easily so it's it's really confrontational and it it's hard to explain but it's uh it's a difficult place to be but usually you know we benefit from going through difficulties it gives us something you know it's not an easy place so you're not gonna sit in a hammock and just sip margaritas you know in India you'll sit in mm-hmm. a hammock and sit out margaritas and the fucking hammock will break and you'll go crashing on your ass and break something and then be dealing with that mm-hmm. <laughs> and in dealing with that you know you're going to learn and grow you know India is just it's falling apart and in that it's beautiful and it's it's just nothing works there the way we think it should work mm-hmm. and um, it, it brings up a lot of stuff I really feel like you can facilitate your karmic process there too. It's like you go through things there um, in a more concentrated way in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense where it might take years and years to go through it here in the States. You might go through it in a month there. Mm-hmm. You know, so it facilitates things just due to that confrontationalness of that society and um, and, and, and what it's like, the, the cleanliness, you know, the smells, the the poverty, the, the lack of... Um, anything that works right, but in it, it's beautiful. You know, it, it's really, really beautiful. It has its own, India has its own intelligence. It has its own rhythm and it's so foreign to us that um, you got me here saying that, you know, nothing there works right. That's just my Western perspective, you know, right. for them it's working fine, mm-hmm. but in it not working right for me, it brought up a lot of stuff for me. And I'm speaking of all this stuff that has nothing to do with even studying with a yoga teacher. Most of my benefit there came from just being there. You know, it has nothing to even do with the yoga teacher. The yoga experience there was uh, its own experience, but India itself is so much more. So I definitely highly recommend it. No, I don't think it's necessary, but I still highly recommend it. Powerful, powerful, powerful place. 
And how, how did you find your way to Vipassana when you were there? Um, I had come, I was practicing physical yoga there with Patavi Joyce. And I, I, I still remember it to this day, because this is, you know, this is like 20, um, to over 25 years ago now. But I still remember walking out of the class feeling really good, you know, walking out feeling amazing and thinking to myself, wow, I'm so strong and I'm so open and I'm so sensitive. Now what? You know, I remember that thought, like, now what? What's next? I mean, this is great, but it can't be all of it because this doesn't seem like it's leading anywhere other than what I got so far. And, you know, I I feel like I still have a lot of purging to do and I have a lot of learning to do and I don't see this giving me that. And like I just said, you know, India being India, you know, which tends to facilitate things within three days of that thought, someone showed up at the yoga class from came down from Northern India, some Westerner, some man who I always remember in my gratitude meditations. And I don't know what he looks like and I don't remember his name, but I'm always thankful for that man He came down and he was like, dude, you got to go try this Vipassana meditation, you know? And I was like, well, tell me about it. And he told me about it. He's like, well, you know, you go in, it's about 12 days, 10 days, silence, not a lot of talk to anybody, you know? You have to meditate 12 hours a day. And I thought, holy shit, that sounds like just insane. But at the same time, it sounded like the real deal, you Mm -hmm. know, something that wasn't watered down to accommodate the westerner you know this is the real shit you're going right. you're going into the fire you know um this was like something for someone serious on the yoga path i mean this was serious shit you know this you're not going to go into this if you're not serious it's just way too scary and um i thought i got to do that cuz there's nothing in my life i'm more serious about than my yoga practice you know there's nothing that's more captivating for me more interesting for me and nothing i'm more dedicated to then being the best that I can be. And I see yoga as that path. Um, so I said, I got to do it, you know? And, uh, and then um, I started trying to figure out how I was going to do it. And I realized I couldn't do it on that trip because my visa was expiring and I had to, I had to um, get out of India, you know, and, and get a new visa. Cause I, uh, they only give you uh, six month visas at a time. And mm-hmm. I had been there six months. So I was, I was leaving India and um, I was going to Hawaii to where my father lived. And I was going to just chill out there for a while, save some money and come back to India. And um, I walked in the door in Hawaii at, at my dad's house. And my dad said, Brian, you got to try this amazing meditation technique that's happening on the other side of the island. It's called Vipassana meditation. I said, what? <laughs> Are you shitting me? It's happening here too. There's a guy that just came down and told me about it and He's like, yeah, I didn't even unpack. I just turned around, I left, I went to the other side of the island and I I enrolled and I I hung out there for 10 days and went through the hardest 10 days of my entire life, Mm. bar none. And then I left knowing, painstakingly knowing that I had to come back, you know, and then um, I So so your first Vipassana was in Hawaii? Hawaii, Oh, okay. And my second one, because then... I saved up enough money after about six months and I was heading back to India. And on the way to India, I did another one in Hawaii, right? And then I got to India and I did another one when I was in India. So, um, you know, within the first year, I already did three of them, you know? So um, I was was going into it pretty strong. And um, anyways, here we are 25 years later. I slowed down a little bit. I've done 20 of them since then. And uh, even a few longer ones than 10 days. Mm -hmm. And... um, and still appreciating the experience and looking forward to the next one. So you, after your experience with Patabi Joyce, you said, and, and now what? And then you do your Vipassana and then you say, and now what? Is there, was there, did that lead you in some direction? Was it, is how does that lead you to LA and, and wanting to teach in LA or? Well, I already was next? teaching in LA. Okay. I was already teaching in LA and um, that was my original impetus for India was, is that I was teaching, but I felt like a hypocrite. I'm like, you know yeah. what? I should go to India. I should, you know, I should be tasting the food that the yogis are eating. And I should be smelling the smells that the yogis are smelling. I want to know where this yoga comes from. I want to know more about it. So 
you know, that's when I called up my teacher in Hawaii and I said, you know, I'd like to go study with your teacher in India. Mm -hmm. And, and who um, was your teacher in Hawaii? My teacher in Hawaii was named David Williams and Brad Ramsey. It was okay. a, a partnership between those two who was teaching Patabi Joyce's Ashtanga Yoga. Mm -hmm. um, and then he gave me the information to Patabi Joyce, and I wrote him a letter and said, can I come and study with you? He wrote back and said, no problem, come. So that's what got me to India. It was just I, I had left Hawaii, came to L.A., and was teaching yoga, or pretty organically, you know, I was actually um, bussing tables and doing my own yoga practice and, um, you know, talking about yoga and people started asking, will you show me, will you show me? And, you mm -hmm. know, pretty soon I actually could quit bussing tables and just be teaching full time, you know, because people were um, liking it and paying mm -hmm. for it. So were, were there other yoga studios in L.A. at the time? Or? Not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I from my, the best of my knowledge there was three yoga studios in Los Angeles as opposed to the 1000 that we have right now. You know, there's three. Um, there was an original Bikram yoga studio. There was an original Iyengar studio and there was Ganga white center for yoga, which was the, I think the very first yoga center in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I think those were the only three yoga centers in all of Los Angeles. Um, like I said, now there's about a thousand. So mm -hmm. we've come a long way since then. Right. Um, but I was teaching, I, w I was teaching at those places, you know, I was teaching at the center for yoga and I was teaching at some clubs, some gyms and, um, I was doing a lot of privates at that point in my life. And I just felt like I really needed a, 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 a good hit of where this yoga comes from. I was just craving to go to India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I saved up my money and I went and, um, you know, the question you asked me was, you know, now do I come out of Vipassana and ask the same question? Now what? The answer is no. Vipassana satiated that. I mean, it, it, there is no now what for me after that. I mean, because um, it gave me the opportunity to explore the unknown. You know, once you have that key to explore the unknown, that unknown is never ending. Mm -hmm. So that exploration never stops. Right. You know, but. You know, when you're just dealing with the physical body, that's limited. You know, your body's limited, but your mind's unlimited. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter how much blue-green algae you chew, and it doesn't matter, you know, how much yoga you do. You know, you're not gonna, your body's not gonna be here in a hundred years. Your body is limited. You know, its range of motion is limited. Its time here is limited. Everything's limited. But we've never discovered the limits of the mind. You know, as far as we know, the mind is unlimited. It's completely untapped. They even say we only use ten percent of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a whole world of exploration into, you know, the, the subtleties of yourself and this world. And, you know, the Vipassana gives gives me the tools to to go into that world. And so if there is a now what, I certainly haven't got close to it. Mm -hmm. And if and if it happens, it happens. But I really feel like the Vipassana is the higher teachings of yoga that no one's teaching. You know, it's no one's teaching that for whatever reason, whether it's not egotistically gratifying because it's not going to shape your butt cheeks, you know, you know, or it's too confrontational because, you know, there's not a greater habit pattern any of us have than, you know, the place where our mind dwells and Vipassana is asking you to, to address that, mm -hmm. which means, you know, you're going to have to address your greatest addiction, which means the withdrawal symptoms are going to be pretty fierce and who the hell wants to deal with that? Yeah. So let's just make yoga physical. So, you know, there's a, I understand why, the yoga has become what it is here in the States, but um, it's also limited. And, you know, I want to, I want people to understand there's more if they want it. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of interesting for me is, is I think that people think of power yoga a lot of times as like a gym yoga, which is, and you're, you're talking about, you know, the complete opposite of that. So do you find it, do you have any frustration with the fact that a lot of people associate power yoga as a physical activity? Yes, I do. You know, I've really had an urge lately to change the name. You know, I just haven't thought of a name that's better. So I'll, I'll keep it power yoga till I think of something better. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with the name. I think what's wrong is people's um, definition of power. You know, I mean, you know, you, you people think power means hardcore, you know, like, you know, the, toughest, strongest, hardest workout in the world, like, you know, you know, conquering, 
you know, that kind of mentality, you know, and, but power is really true power is the opposite. True power is love, acceptance, softness, gentleness, um, calmness, compassion, gratitude. You know, I mean, think about the teachings of the greatest of the great. You know, these are the most powerful teachings, right? Of Jesus, Buddha, and Gandhi. And, you know, what did they teach? You know, I mean, that's the powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with the name power yoga, but I think, you know, people's definition is a little bit skewed. And, um, and um, I don't want to alienate anybody with that name. You mm -hmm. know, I want people to feel welcome to come to power yoga. I don't want people to think, oh, I can't do that. It's too hard. Mm -hmm. And that's the impetus for wanting to change the name. But there's really nothing wrong with the word power. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, what's wrong is our definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Is that, it, yeah, one of um, the other people who has had a big influence on my life is Eckhart Tolle. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I'm not. I know. I've heard his name. I haven't read uh, those books yet. Yeah, but he has um, one of his books. His, his main book is called The Power of Now. So it's funny that. <laughs> Makes sense. Power <laughs> Yoga and, and The Power of Now. Right, right. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, yeah, if that 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 word can be used in a really benevolent way, true, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think people think power is in like you know, the king with the greatest army is the most powerful. You know, I mean, I think people think that's uh, that's good, you know. But uh, I look at power as completely different. I look at it as the king that lost the war and learned from it. <laughs> that king is powerful. You know, that king has got humility now and that king, you know, has understanding now and perspective now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I look at it as a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you started, when you had started teaching in LA, you were teaching at other studios and then eventually you, did you, open up your own studio and is that when you started doing donation based yoga yes i mean when i first started i was teaching it like i said privately and i was teaching at gyms and um and um you know one thing i really appreciated about vipassana meditation was is it was all run on donation that was another mind-blowing aspect of it was is that okay you go there they feed you they house you and they teach you and they don't charge you it's all donation Right. And it's like, it's mind blowing. It's like, wait, there's no charge for this. You're just going to let me give you whatever I want to give you. If I even want to give you anything. Yeah. You know, that's it. You know, we're going to be successful if we're supposed to be successful. There'll be enough money in that donation box. You know, if we're supposed to continue doing what we're doing, if the universe wants this to happen, it will happen. Mm -hmm. You know, they were like, they were like, living in a, on a different principle, you know, they were like living and the, what they were offering wasn't about making money. It was about making you well, you know, they weren't charging you, you know, so it wasn't about money, you know, it was really about, you know, giving to you something valuable. Mm -hmm. And then if you wanted to give something back, then, you know, they were open to that, mm -hmm. but that had nothing to do with their desire for your wellness and, you know, your, you know, your evolution. So I just thought it was beautiful. And I thought to myself, why can't we do that in other aspects of this society? You know, why can't we do that in other businesses? Mm -hmm. You know, so I had the idea of opening a yoga center on donation basis. And that was the beginning of donation based yoga in this country. Mm -hmm. Maybe the world, I'm not sure exactly what was happening everywhere on the planet, but, um, as far as I know, it wasn't happening anywhere other than Vipassana. And, um, you know, and so I, I, um, when I left the places that I was teaching, you know, cause those were not my places. So I didn't really have control of how, you know, it, how it was being charged or, you know, that the business part of it. Um, when I opened my own place, it was mine. I could do whatever the hell I wanted. So I said, you know, what? I'm going to open a donation based yoga studio. And that's exactly what I did. And, um, you know, it basically exploded in popularity and, um, and here we are. That was, uh, maybe 20, 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, there's donation based studios all over the place now, you know, and it really inspired people and it's, it's been great. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. been great. Now you do, let me ask you this. I, when you travel and teach though, those classes are not donation based. 
Well, it depends on the studio. I mean, I've done it on donation based yoga. Okay. Like um, some of my students have opened up studios. Um, like uh, Paul Terrell opened a studio. Um, I don't know if you know Paul. Yeah, from, I know Paul. So he opened up a studio in Portland called Yoga on Yam Hill, mm-hmm. right? Donation based studio. So when I go up to him, we do it on donation. You know, okay, we do a cool. workshop totally on donation, mm-hmm. and then you know we do a split of the donations. You know. But when I go to teach at other studios, those are not my studios, mm-hmm. you know, so I'm not in charge of how they do business, you know. I just go there and um, I just say, hey, if you do it on donation, okay, we'll do it a split of the donations. Mm-hmm. If you charge, then we'll do a split of the charging. That's your business. It's your studio. You do what you want, mm-hmm. and, I'll, I'll, and I'll go with it. So most studios in the country are charging, and, um, you know, so that's the way it goes. They'll charge for my workshops. Um, and I don't see anything wrong with that. You know, it's, everybody has a right to do it any way they want. There's not a right or wrong way, you know, so it's all good. You mm-hmm. know, it's all good. And, um, and workshops also are kind of extracurricular activities, you know, um, you know, for a daily yoga practice, you know, it's, it certainly makes it available to more people if you do it on donation basis, mm-hmm. you know, cause money is an issue to some people. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, when I started yoga, I could go, I could take classes twice a month. That was all I could afford. And it's definitely not enough. Exactly. I mean, if you lived here in LA, you can come every day, mm-hmm. you know? So I think for regular yoga classes, you know, I mean, I think donation is more important than a special event, you know, special events, you know, are not some things that are not as necessary mm-hmm. as your daily practice. Right. So, you know, I mean, special events, it could go either way. And uh, if you can pull it off and do it on donation, that's awesome. And mm-hmm. we've done that many times. Mm-hmm. And if the students want to charge, that's fine too. Right. Um, you were teaching in LA as donation based and building a huge community because people could, I mean, they, they must have really getting something out of what you were doing, but also they think the fact that it was donation based that I think it just creates this different vibe. That's more of a trust, I guess. And, um, but also this, um, traveling. Oh, let's talk about that. How did, how did you get, how did you start to travel and teach? Because uh, the, you know, pre-internet, how are you going to get out there and and share what you're doing with the world? I mean, now you can just put your classes online, but then, you know, back then you had to, I guess, travel in order to to um, you know spread what you were you were trying to teach. Yeah, we um, it was different. Although you know, there is internet now, and it's you know everywhere, and I still travel just as much. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so traveling is still something that, that, you know, like showing up and being there in person, I guess is still benefiting people because they're still, I'm um, sending invitations. Um, but it all originated in, you know, very organically, you know, I mean, I never, here I am, let's see, I've been, I've been traveling and teaching for very close to 25 years, you know, um, and um, I, teach in a hundred cities every year, different cities every single year. Um, and so, you know, 20 years, 25 years, a hundred cities every year. I mean, what is that? 20, 25 times a hundred, 2,500 city. Well, I, I repeat cities. I'll go back mm-hmm. to the same city over and over again. So it's not necessarily 2,500 different cities, but 2,500 different events. Mm-hmm. And not one of those events have I ever solicited, ever. I've never in my life sent an email to someone saying, hey, can I teach at your studio or can I teach at your event? You know, in other words, it's all happened really organically. You know, like LA, probably my biggest um, asset has been teaching in Los Angeles because You know, this has become the epicenter for yoga and fitness. It's always been the epicenter for fitness pretty much, right? So, um, you know, people come to L.A. to see what's happening. And, you know, there's no doubt people came to L.A. to see what's going on in the yoga scene. And, you know, Mm -hmm. what was going on in the yoga scene back in the day was Brian Cast. You know, that's what was going on. You know, it was like this big scene, right? I mean, we would have Mm -hmm. lines down the street and... Um, you know, hundreds of people in a class. I mean, you know, I packed a, a, over 180 people a class, you know, I mean, it was just insane stuff, you know? And um, so there was, a there was, the word got out. So people would come and they'd come to check it out. And then afterwards they'd come up to me and they'd say, hey, will you come and teach at my studio? Will you come and teach at my studio? So 
you know, um, the invitation started rolling in. And to this day, you know, my one of my the jobs my assistant does is field invitations. Like, you know, someone will invite us and then show, you know, email back and say, hey, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. It's such an honor. You know, um, this is what it takes to get Brian to come. Um, you know, are you able to do that? And if you are, let's find a date. Mm-hmm. So that's what's happened. And um, it's happened really organically, which I personally appreciate, you know, that it's just been really natural. And um, so that's how it's happened. You know, I mean, it's just people get a wind of what we're doing and they, you know, have the the gumption to say, hey, I want you to come to our city. Some people might think, oh, he'll never come, you know, and they don't mm-hmm. even bother to ask. Little do they know, I'll go anywhere, uh-huh. you know, because why not? Right. Especially if you want to compensate me in a manner that I'm not going to lose money by coming. Mm-hmm. Why not? Mm-hmm. You know, now there's reasons why not, because now I have kids, you know, so now it's a little bit more difficult to travel because I'm trying to balance that with being a father and I want to be there for my kids. But I still will travel now to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I might do one trip, you know, one little six day tour a month now, whereas b- before I might have done two. You know, I so said do 12 cities a month before and now I do, you know, five or six cities a month. Okay. So I travel less, but I still do it. You know? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the reason I'm asking some of these questions is because I think there are other teachers out there that would be interested in doing this kind of a thing, and I don't know that it really helps them to say, well, it just happened organically for me. You know, I I think that things are more competitive now maybe, so there's probably a little bit more hustle required in order to, or, you know, a little bit getting out there and, and really trying to make things happen a little bit more. I don't know. Possibly, you know, I mean, yeah, I probably didn't give the answer that they wanted to hear. Like <laughs> they probably wanted to hear, yeah, do this, do this, and yeah. then that will happen. Yeah. But no, that's not it all happened. You know, my advice to people is is that just show up and teach every day. That's my advice. Just show up and teach every day and all good things will come from that, you know? And yeah, you might have to put yourself out there more in a promotional sense if, you know, if you're interested in people outside of your community knowing about you but that wasn't my interest it just happened naturally Mm -hmm. you know i wasn't thinking oh this is going to make me world famous i mean the last thing you think back then would be this will make you world famous i mean most of the people thought it was devil worship Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) if anything this is going to get me crucified Uh all right yeah (laughs) i'll be world famous after i'm dead Uh you know (laughs) But, um, you know, people were like, you know, people were like intimidated by yoga. Yeah, a friend, a were, friend of mine, her, uh, his mother, um, was asking me about yoga and she's like, uh, what you do yoga? And she, you could tell she was really, and I was, uh, I was explaining it to her, you know, what it was and what we do. And she's like, well, can't you just call it stretching? I'd feel a lot more comfortable with that. <laughs> right. Well, she's probably Christian. Yeah. <laughs> she was. You know, it's but the thing is, is people are scared about things they don't know about. And, mm-hmm. you know, back then I was dealing with, I mean, that mentality is is um, way diluted now, you know, with every Tom, Dick, and Harry doing yoga, with a yoga studio at every corner and every famous person doing yoga. I think most of the mainstream America is not, you know, intimidated by yoga and not looking at yoga um, from the, through the same lens that maybe our parents and their parents were looking at it from, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's very different. And, um, but back then it wasn't something you did to be well known, you know? I mean, it was like the only reason I did it is because I loved it. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that um, other people happened to be interested. It was like being at the right time in the right place, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But I always tell people, listen, just do what you love to do. And, you know, I had a teacher at my studio that actually came up to me and asked me, you know, what's your advice? And I just, I said what I just said. I said, just keep doing yoga. And I said, don't take a vacation. Not for a long time. I said, just show up every day and teach, you know, build something, build momentum, build energy, build. And once you really build it, then you can take a vacation. Cause then it, you know, it's like a train. Once it gets chugging, you know, even if you turn off the engine, it's going to keep going, mm-hmm. you know, then you turn the engine back on and you pick up. Right. I mean, right. but you know, if you don't get it, the momentum, and you turn off the engine, it's just going to stall out. Mm-hmm. Right. So mm-hmm. just show up and teach, you know, and, um, just do it, you know, keep being there, you know, and, you know, if it's supposed to happen, it will, there'll be a, someone in your class, you know, that, you know, you know, 
um, know someone else who needs someone, a yoga teacher to do this project or, you know, or there'll be someone mm-hmm. that needs this person to do a private yoga lesson. And, you know, next thing you know, you know, you're, you know, going to Obama's house for yoga. You know what I mean? It's like, right. you don't really know how it's going to work out. And, you know, that's what this person did. And this person is now highly successful. And it just so happens that there is this like multi-zillionaire producer son in one of his classes. And this producer son you know, didn't know what the hell to do with his life, you know, and was in one of his classes and got this bright idea that, you know what, he wants to be involved in yoga, you know, and, uh, you know, he has all this access to money and all this access to studios. And mm-hmm. so he started producing this, this, these yoga products. And mm-hmm. he wanted this guy, this teacher of mine to be the front man for it all because mm-hmm. he loved his class. He loved his charisma. He loved and now, you know, here he is, you know, he's still showing up every day to teaching, but mm-hmm. now he has this entire ancillary, you know, in, you know income stream coming right. in from this project he did with making these yoga videos and DVDs. Mm-hmm. And other people around the world are now seeing these yoga videos and DVDs, and they're mm-hmm. calling him up and saying, hey, will you come teach in my community? And boom, it's happening. But mm-hmm. it all happened by just him showing up. So I still think the same thing works. Right. You know, and, you know, it's it's. I don't think you can, um, you know, you can prevent your karma from happening. Right. You know, and it's nothing against, you know, self-promotion. If that's what you're into, then, you know, that's going to be the facilitator. Yeah, but I I, think you said something important there. You said uh, being open to, and to, you know, your own, your own life process, your own experience and essentially kind of allowing your own path to happen. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I know a yoga teacher, another yoga teacher, world famous, and um, he couldn't even get a job in Los Angeles. Like, he would teach yoga and no one would come, Mm -hmm. right? He knew his shit back and forth. He was really a a well-educated person in yoga and really an amazing man, but he did not have whatever it took to rise to the top in the LA yoga community, right? So... And he even got fired from studios because no one was coming to his classes. And so the studio owners weren't making money off him. And so they basically said goodbye, right? Mm-hmm. So he left LA. He went to his home state. He got some funds together and he produced a set of yoga videos, right? And then he spent every penny he had taking out advertisements and magazines on his yoga videos. And pretty soon, He was famous in the sense that everybody in the yoga community was just constantly plastered with his advertisements. Mm -hmm. So we'd see him. We they most people didn't know who he was. They just assumed he was some big time yoga teacher, (laughs) right? Uh And you know, then but through those videos and through his own self promotion and through all that, this is a guy who couldn't get a job in L.A. Right? Uh He's now one of the biggest yoga teachers in the world. He gets invited to teach all over the world, and he's developed something that I think is. fairly charismatic and people are really appreciating and you know and due to his struggle of not being able to get a job you know he developed a kind of a deep humility Mm. you know and he brings that humility wherever he goes and people just you know eat it up because it's real and it's beautiful right and um and he's completely successful so Mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of ways to do it you know i mean i just kind of share the way that i did it yeah yeah unwittingly did it Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm So, um, you, you did yoga videos, you, um, how did that come about? That was the, basically the same as I've been explaining to, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, I just was doing what I was doing and there was some producers in the class who happened to be producing one of the hottest TV shows. And at the time a show called Miami vice and they, you know, this, so they were like producing one of the hottest TV shows. So they were fairly connected to, um, um, the production community, the, you know, the, the entertainment community, the studios. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they spent a lot of time and energy trying to convince the studios to do some yoga videos, you know, and uh, they convinced Warner brothers who has a fitness, who had a fitness line. Um, you know, I think they were doing like the Jane Fonda's or, you know, the fitness videos, you know, mm-hmm. whatever it is, uh, Richard Simmons, who knows whatever was big at that time. And, um, 
they convinced Warner Brothers to do a, 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 some yoga videos, you know, and they asked me if I would do them. So that's how it happened. So here I am now doing yoga videos for Warner Brothers, you know, and so that was pretty amazing. And yeah, yeah. it was amazing how it happened. Like, like I've been explaining to you, it's just like, wow. Like I, every time I turned around, I was getting blown away at like what was going on. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't even believe it. You know, like I'm on the set doing this video, you know, with all these cameras. I mean, I'm a Detroit boy. I mean, I, you know, this is a fantasy, right? Like mm -hmm. now you're like the star of a movie and these yeah. cameras mm -hmm. are rolling and they're like action, you know, and you're like, mm -hmm. you now you're in a movie. I mean, I was <laughs> like, what the fuck, man? Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I was blown away by it, you know, yeah. so, but it was all happening, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't even know how it was happening because I certainly didn't try to make it happen, yeah. but yeah. I was happy it was happening. It was like, it was exciting. And, um, you know, and it was helping a lot of people too. You know, yeah. it was, it was a vehicle to spread yoga. So, and that was exciting. And there's nothing that makes my day more. And this happens quite often, you know, especially when I teach around the world outside of LA, people come up to me and they say, you know, I started with your videos and I just smile and be like, wow, it worked, you know, because yeah. Warner Brothers never, you know, they basically, you know, kind of wrote me off you know like I never you know I did the videos they gave me a little bit of money it certainly wasn't a lot you know and then I never heard from them again you know so like I never mm -hmm. made any residuals or nothing I didn't know how they were selling if it was successful and then I heard like a short time later they canceled their entire fitness business so they got rid of everything you know I mean or they stopped producing whatever so um Anyway, so I never really knew what, you know, were those successful, were they not mm -hmm. successful, what happened, you know, and so it's always been amazing for me to be able to, you know, hear people say, hey, I started with your Warner Brothers videos, and mm -hmm. I want to thank you, and I'm like, wow, cool. Did they start, they stopped selling them, and then... I think they, they still sell them, but they don't make any more fitness stuff mm -hmm. and they don't spend any money on promoting what they already made. Mm -hmm. It's there, just there. There must be a, it's a like ton a, of those must have sold by now. So I think it, yeah. from what I heard, it's their largest selling fitness video. Wow. But they don't promote it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it took a lot while to get there because it was all word of mouth, all word of mouth, you mm -hmm. know? And, but you know, like you can buy them on Amazon, you know, I think Amazon still sells them and I think they buy them from Warner Brothers. Like Warner Brothers has them in their catalog. So if you order them, they'll burn off a bunch of DVDs for the store or the company that's ordering them. Um, but but you, you didn't get anything from all those sales? I mean, in well, financially. I didn't get financially anything, mm -hmm. nothing. You know, which was always curious to me. Like, yeah. where's all that? Where'd that go if it was number one selling fitness video? But but I did get a lot because sure. those videos put my name out there in the world, which made mm -hmm. more people interested in me, which maybe they Googled me, mm -hmm. you know, or Yahoo'd me because they didn't have Google yet or yeah. whatever was before Yahoo. Yeah. Well, for me, it was, that was my first video. My first, go. I started doing yoga with there you go. Power Yoga 2. I just had the, the VHS tape. I wandered into a bookstore mm -hmm. and just grabbed it off the shelf. And that was, yeah, that was my start. There you go. So it worked. And so yeah. in that way, it really did help me because it, 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 that was probably a catalyst to a lot of the invitations that we were talking about earlier. Right. And um, so, you know, like I said, invitations were rolling in. So here I am traveling around the world making good money doing that. So in a way, it did take care of me, even though I didn't get any money from the um, the production or sales of the videos. I mean, they paid me a... I think I got thirty thousand dollars, which was more money than I'd ever seen in my life at that time. But um, that was it. I got that check, and I never heard another word about it mm -hmm. ever. <laughs> You're being open, um, open to stuff happening, and open to changes throughout your career. What do you see happening in the future? Anything online? You just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, I just keep doing what I'm doing. You know to. I, First of all, I've never had a goal. I've really honestly never had a goal, right? I just doing what I love to do at any given day, right? I've never had a goal and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Seriously. I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with goals, but I never had one. You know, I just, cause I never for sure knew, mm -hmm. you know, I just knew what I wanted to do right now, you know, which was whether when I was a 16 year old, it was to get high and drop out of school, you know, and as right now what it is is, you know, 
um, teaching my classes, running my studio, and cultivating this power yoga online because I really feel like this is an amazing vehicle. And I'm into it now, and I'm doing it now. I don't know what's going to happen in, in, in 10 years. You know, I don't know where I'm going to be and what I'm going to be doing. You know, I'd like to say that you know this online business would be flourishing and all that, and that would be great if it is. Um, but right now, I'm just trying to make it flourish. I'm not worried about what it's going to be like in 10 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, how about one piece of advice you would give the newer student? Um, it's it's hard to think of one piece of advice. So I always give the same advice to a new student, you know, which is um, to um, to never be dismayed at you know the um, if you walk into a class and you don't like it, you know, don't you know don't let that be your entire picture of what yoga is. I mean, yoga is expressed in so many different ways. So um, you know, keep trying. There's so many different expressions of it, and there's probably something out there that you'll resonate with. So. Don't let your first class be your picture of what it is, you know, I mean, because, you know, the, the teacher could be, you know, um, unappealing, you know, the, the routine that they're giving you could be unappealing, the way they're expressing it could be unappealing, but it doesn't mean that someone else can't do it in a really appealing way. So, you know, that's one thing that I, I like to say to people who are new in it to it also, you know, is, um, you know, keep looking until you find something you like, because there's a lot out there and I'm going to tell you that, you know, one class doesn't represent it all. Yeah. So if people want to reach you, how can they reach you? Um, basically power yoga.com. I mean, that's basically it. I mean, that's my world, right? Mm -hmm. And you open that up and now you're in my world, you know? And then from that, you know, if you're interested in coming to classes, you can get all the information for classes. If you're not living in LA, you can get, um, all the information for, I'm streaming classes to wherever you're at, you know, our online services. And then, you know, obviously there's a list of all the workshops I'm doing around the world. So, you know, you can find, I'll probably be coming to your city soon. So mm-hmm. I'll be there or at least your state, you know, yeah. or probably your country. And, uh, and also, um, you know, our, 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 our trainings and our um, workshops and our retreats all over the place too, you know? So, um, you know, basically power yoga.com and there's even a contact us button. So, Right. If there's any other question you need to ask, something more specific, then uh, we're there for you too. And you're on Facebook now too, right? Yeah, well, Power Yoga is on Facebook. So um, okay. I think it's called Brian Cass Power Yoga on Facebook. And um, there's a couple, but Brian Cass, I think some people have started some fan sites, mm-hmm. you know, but there's one that has like over 20,000 likes and that's the main one, right? But there is, I think it's Brian Cass Power Yoga. That's the Facebook for for us. Okay. And that reminded me of one other thing I wanted to ask you was the, uh, how many classes have you taught at this point? Well, um, you know, believe it or not, I keep track, <laughs> you know, in, in a rough way I keep track, you know? Um, and so every December I add up all the classes that I teach and I add that to the whole. So I haven't done it this year yet, but as of last December, it was like 18,100 classes. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's bringing yoga to a lot of people. Yeah, and that's that's a lot of gray hair, you know, because uh-huh. there's only one way you're going to teach that many classes, and that's because you're teaching for one hell of a long time. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're at I'm at about um, I'm close to 30 years now teaching, you know. So, well, uh, thank you for your your time for this uh, this discussion, and uh, thank you for all the amazing work you've done helping people throughout the world. It's uh. It's really an amazing thing you've done. Definitely affected my life in the, in an amazing way. And I'm sure many, many people that have never even gotten the chance to, to thank you, um, have really, um, a better life because of you. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your time and, uh, hope you continue to have a, a wonderful life. You're welcome. My honor, my pleasure. You're right. welcome. Thanks, Brian. So there you have it, my extended interview with Brian Kest. I mean, what an honor. You know, I've been to his teacher trainings and yoga workshops, many of them over the years, and I'd always thought, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a way for him to share this information, not the, the, the physical teaching part only, but the, the, the talks and the, the advice that just comes out of him. And it's just so often I find it to be so powerful and so moving and so helpful. And I thought it would be great for someone to capture that someday. And for me to be able to do that was just such an honor. The one thing I really liked that he he said was about um, how your body is limited, but your mind is unlimited. 
and that the keys to exploring your mind further can be found through Vipassana. So if you do want to take that on, he did say that Vipassana was the hardest thing he'd ever done in his life, and it is a supreme challenge. But if you do want to take it on, uh, you can go to dhamma.org. The Vipassanas are 10 days long, at least uh, if you do one as a beginner, and they're donation-based, so you can just take some time and go for it. Also, uh, I do recommend Brian's classes. You can access his classes anywhere in the world um, online. And But even better, like you said, he does travel to 100 cities a year, so good chance he will be coming by somewhere near you. And I definitely recommend that you take one of his classes in person. Just the, the energy is absolutely amazing. And one other thing that he said that I really like to hear was uh, when I tell people that I teach power yoga, they tend to think of it as a physical practice. And I really liked when Brian said that true power is love. And that's what we're trying to teach. So that's it for today. I look forward to hearing from you guys. I do love to hear from you. So go ahead and drop me a line at chrisbrownstudios.com. And namaste, everybody. Thanks for listening to Practically Conscious. You can find more at chrisbrownstudios.com and on Facebook at Chris Brown Studios. Make consciousness mainstream by starting with yourself. Have a wonderful day.